Oh, it's very, very dry, some ground indeed. Kuntep Chayong, can, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you, but uh, it's, there might be some problem with the connection. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. Yeah, okay. It's very better. clear uh, now. Sorry for, yeah, sorry for the technical the errors. Yes. Of course, I could not have mentioned uh, this is uh, a very dry songkan, so and songkan like indeed. I think in our life we have never seen anything like this before, because when we talk about songkan, uh, the pictures that immediately comes up in our in our mind are people splashing water at each other, and you know, people I mean, celebrating, enjoying festivities. But this time around, I mean, all these things are, are something that we, we don't see. At least, I mean, today is a New Year's Day, right? The traditional New Year's Day. The country yes. should have been full of uh, spirit and uh, festivities. It's a very, very quiet day. Yes, that's right. It's very strange, some ground for all of us, but we have to live with reality of COVID-19. But there is some slight hint of hope because today, Confirm of new cases, uh, 38, lowest in three weeks. Kun Thep Chai. Yes, uh, it's very encouraging sight indeed. I mean, even though it is not a uh, confirmation that we have turned the corner, but this uh, continuous trend of the number of infections coming down. And today we have uh, 28 cases. I mean, this is remarkable. But of course, it's something that we should be glad about, but not something to be too overjoyed with. Because we all know that the bigger challenge is ahead of us. Yes, for the number of new cases, 28 today. State quarantine in soon. These are two cases far from state quarantine in soon and one in Jala. But still, even though the new cases, 28 is the lowest in three weeks, we all have to keep stringent measure intact, especially with what Dr. Tawi Sin, Wisanu Yotin, spokesman of COVID-19 center, have told us that the guard has to remain quite high and we cannot, be, we cannot underestimate the whole situation of COVID-19 in Thailand, even though the downward trend is appearing in front of us, but we still have to keep all the measures intact. Yeah, when we were talking earlier about the, the bigger challenge ahead, we, uh, we were referring specifically to a large number of Thais who are on the waiting list to return to Thailand from overseas. Many of them will be crossing the borders from neighboring countries. And of course, these people are now a major source of concern for medical authorities. And they are taking a lot of uh, precautionary measures to make sure that uh, these people don't come back in big groups at once. Uh, they should come back gradually. And then each will be subject to a state or local quarantine to make sure that they do not spread the virus if any of them are infected. That's right. And if we take a look at the whole country, Phuket is the most intense rate of infection, according to the statistic that they have compiled. Per 100,000 population, Phuket has the rate of infection of about 44, which means the most intense area of infection in Thailand. Even though if we take a look at just the number of the cases, Thai Bangkok, has more cases than Phuket. But if we compare with the population of 100,000, Phuket is the most infection rate 
in the country คุณเทพชัย No questions Phuket is now posing the biggest concern for medical authorities if you remember In the, in the last week of March, Phuket had only one infection case, and it was something that uh, we welcomed that good news back then. But within one month, the, the, a lot of changes have taken place. Now, Phuket has become the province with the highest rate of uh, infection, considering the, the, the small uh, size of the population of the island province. And it was not until April the 4th, that medical authorities in the province began the so-called active testing, focusing on three particular groups of people. One of them was were people who were related to entertainment businesses, and then the other group, the second group, uh, is a group those who are who have been in contact with the people who were infected, and then the third group are the so-called high-risk group. These are people that uh, are sort of a habit in contact with uh, foreigners or involved in businesses that would expose them to to uh, contacting the virus. And another problem was Kunata, as pointed out by Dr. Tavisin spokesman uh, today, that most of the um, almost more than half of the infected person didn't come to seek medical checkup until after. Three days. Some of them came after seven days, so that means that uh, many of them didn't may, may not may not have shown symptoms at that point. But once they were checked up and then found to be tested positive, then it was a bit too late for people to to react. Yes, and if we take a look in the past two weeks, the cause of infection in Thailand mostly is from transmitted from previous case. That's the number one of the new infection in Thailand. The second is Thai returnees, Thai who return from abroad. This is the second most cause of infection. And the third is risky occupation, like people who still have to work in the indoor facility and having close contact with others still remain as risky occupation. And the fourth is medic medical personnel who are. Fighting the front line are the most people who likely to be infected of COVID-19, and the fifth is people who still work in entertainment venues. Even though the order has closed all the entertainment venues, but the risk still remain from the previous situation. k u n t e p c h a i Yeah, once we begin to see the infection cases going down. In number, then, then many people have will start asking whether or not some of the stringent measures that have been imposed, including the curfews, should be relaxed. Of course, the medical personnel who are heavily involved in the fight against this deadly virus caution against any early re relaxation of these uh, stringent measures because they believe that. These measures are largely responsible for bringing down the infection numbers. So, if they can have their way, they would rather see all these stringent measures to be in place. But of course, the government may have a different ideas. And uh, according to reports that we have today, uh, the some of the committees responsible for working with the government in deciding uh, these stringent measures have been also assigned to. Find out whether there could be possibility of some of this measure could be relaxed. Well, but for the time being, it seems that we still have to keep our guard high to have strict stringent measure right now in order to cope with the situation. Because if we relax today, the number of infection perhaps won't increase tomorrow, but it will take time, like four or five days at least, before the. New trend or the new group of infection is being shown in the next four to five days. That's why we still have to remain using stringent measure for now. Yeah, I think the message from the prime minister is clear that he still has no intention of relaxing these tough measures yet, because he believes that uh, it, it was because of these measures. That's why the number of the new infections. 
has been gradually come down. And if we take a look to the whole region, ASEAN, Southeast Asia, Singapore last week, the number has been increased quite sharply because of foreign arrivals of people who return to Singapore from other countries and it has become new cause of infection in Singapore. And the government has been trying to introduce more strict measure in Singapore, like closing down all the school, all the public institution and university as well, and to have more strict measure on workplaces to try to prevent more cases of new imported case in Singapore. And Indonesia as well, right now, the number of total infection in Indonesia is quite high. Total death is 399 deaths. Total number of confirmed cases in Indonesia is about 4,500 cases. Kuntep Chai. Yeah, most of the ASEAN countries, or most of the 10 ASEAN countries are facing similar challenge now. And uh, tomorrow, uh, for the first time, the ASEAN leaders will have a virtual summit to discuss the measures or how they can coordinate corporate to fight against this deadly virus and Prime Minister Bajut and Rocha will represent Thailand in communicating with the other ASEAN countries. Of course, Vietnam as the chair of uh, ASEAN this year will be chairing the, the online meeting. It's a virtual meeting for the ASEAN leaders for the first time. Of course, we know that it has to be done this way because of the coronavirus. So no, uh, no ASEAN leaders certainly would want to come face to face with one another under such circumstances. That's right. So it would be quite interesting to see what's the mechanism that ASEAN will introduce in order to cope with coronavirus. And on top of meeting among 10 ASEAN countries, they have arranged to be meeting with three countries like ASEAN plus three. So it will be like tele summit meeting among ASEAN leaders and plus three countries. China, South Korea, and Japan as well to try to solve the COVID-19 situation all together. And one of mechanism that perhaps they are going to use is ASEAN fund to try to alleviate financial burden and economic impact among ASEAN countries. Kuntep Chai. Yeah, hopefully the tomorrow's summit will come up with some coordinated uh, plans that will help the 10 ASEAN countries, plus the China, Japan, and South Korea to work together in dealing with this dire situation. Yes, it's really important indeed because ASEAN have internal issue as well in terms of having different groups of different countries. The country which are facing most at infection right now are Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, and Thailand. And other countries still haven't reported more infection right now. So the case of concern are among four or five countries of ASEAN. But of course, because we are neighbors, so concerted effort need to be introduced and worked together in the region. And in South Korea, Kuntep Chai, there is a report on Monday that at least 116 people initially cleared of the new coronavirus had tested positive again in South Korea. And this is what official has suggested to the whole country that perhaps easing strict recommendation aimed at preventing new outbreak has to be postponed because South Korea reported new cases, but the imported cases have added to new infection in the country. So they have to be quite be aware of the measure they are doing right now in South Korea. And Korea Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, KCDC, has said the virus may have been reactivated 
rather than the patient being reinfected. And during this outbreak like coronavirus, perhaps we would like to hear good news or uplifting piece of report as well. And one of the correspondents who are doing this is Mr. James Longman from ABC News. And right now he is joining us live from London. Good evening, James. Good evening from Bangkok. Can you hear us? It Hi, seems... James. Can, good evening. Can you hear us? We have trouble no. with the voice okay. of King James. No. All right. So we, uh, we try to reconnect with him, hoping that we have a better We can connection. see you, James, but we cannot hear you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, our, our, team, our team will try to solve the issue. As Gunatha mentioned, Jim has been reporting on very inspiring stories about victims or people who are involved in the operation to fight the deadly virus. Of course, in times like this, uh, these are certainly stories, uh, news or information that people would love to hear uplifting, inspiring stories that give people hope. Yes, that's quite important at this very juncture as well, Kuntep Chai, because during the crisis, we tend to hear about negative trends or how the outbreak is quite unstoppable and how Epicenter is now moved to the US and how people the number of dead toll is quite high all over the world. But we all need something to, to feel a little bit more relief from the situation. No, in fact, in circumstances like this, in our crises, there are always acts of kindness. There are always people I mean, who demonstrate their spirit of volunteerism to help out uh, in, what, in whichever way they can. And uh, these are the people that shine the light and give us hope, even in the darkest hours. And James, I mean, has, been, has done, a, 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 certainly has done a very good service for the society by finding out where these stories are and then report them to, to these audiences. Yes, Kun James has his own column, which called Feel Good News for ABC News in the US. And he has shared what's the positive trend from the coronavirus outbreak in many countries. Like for example, when New Zealand has reported very low number of infection, and what's the reaction from Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern. So it has set like good example for other countries in order to adopt very efficient measure to fight with COVID-19. And he also shows some image of how people spend their time at home during this work at home, stay at home, and social distancing measures. Yeah, and we hope that uh, James sooner or later can share some of the stories in Thailand. Of course, in Thailand, we don't have shortage of uh, people with good heart. I mean, who would not stop to, to would not let, be reluctant I mean, to help out, who are always willing I mean, to go out and lend a hand, even in times of like this. And certainly we would love to have these stories shared, I mean, to, to the, rest of the, the rest of the audience in the world. Yes, and talking about working from home, we also have beautiful story from a mother who needs to take care of her young, of her young child in the family in Thailand as well. So let's take a look of this beautiful story. Mahidon University. After the Ministry of Education closed all schools and universities across the country to help slow down the transmission of the new coronavirus, she has been working from home. But she's not the only one at home. 
Petria has a 16-month-old son who depends on her most of the time, which makes working from home a challenge. In the past, she always had someone to help her look after her baby boy while she was working full-time at the university. Now, she has become a full-time mother while working from home. Teaching online requires more preparation than normal classroom lessons. Patria admitted that sometimes it is very difficult to concentrate on work when the little boy is clamoring for her attention. Fortunately, she had help from her husband, who is a lecturer and also works from home. They began split shift parenting. He looks after their son in the morning when Patria is teaching online. Then she takes over for afternoon shift. The pandemic has changed the lifestyles of most people, including Patria. She says that she has to make a plan before going to buy grocery, which she had never needed to do before. The biggest concern for a working mother with a small kid during the virus crisis like Patria is the confined space for her son. She wants the boy to have a chance to explore the world outside their home. So the family goes to a local park once a week. While her work home divide has gone, she stays positive in a potentially negative situation. Patria said that working from home presents a good opportunity to spend quality time with her son. She offers advice to mothers who are struggling with simultaneously working from home and looking after their small children. You're still lucky because you still have a job, you still get paid and get to spend a quality time with your loved one. Of course, it's tough and very exciting. Apart from that, find some nice activity that we all can enjoy doing it together. Probably something nice around the house, in the garden, or play time with your kid. So that's how a young Thai mother is working from home with her young kid as well. And right now, our line is ready to connect with James Longman, ABC News correspondent. He's now live from Japan and joining us live from London. Sorry, James. Good evening. Welcome to Thai PBS World tonight. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can, um, everything seems okay on your end. It's lovely to see you again. Yes, okay. can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, all right. Okay, good, good. So, James, how are things in London? Well, it's obviously an uncertain time for everybody. You know, it's difficult. Britain is going to be probably the most um, hard-hit country in Europe. So it's uncertain. We've just had Boris Johnson, the prime minister, in hospital. He went into the intensive care unit. But now, thankfully, he's, he's out. He's out of danger. And Britain is trying to figure out, you know, how long it's going to be before life can go back to normal, I think. So lot, like lots of other countries. Yes. And you have your own column, Good Coronavirus News. And how do you discover good news? about coronavirus? Look, I think um, whenever there's something negative happening, whenever something difficult happens, people always respond in an amazing way. It doesn't matter what the story is, there's always good that happens. Um, people all are at home now, stuck, thinking of creative things to do. So they're using Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and they're sharing lots of exciting or funny or interesting or creative moments and so there's lots and lots of um, content I guess and people are being really um, I suppose creative with the ways that they do things and it, it just goes to show what we're capable of when we're faced with a struggle you know I remember when I was in Thailand and we covered obviously the boys in the cave the wild boar team this was a it was a sad story. It was a it was a dangerous situation for the boys, but it was a story about unity and the country coming together. And this is the same. It's a sad situation, but it's also a story about humankind coming together. James, I've seen the, some of your stories. 
they are very inspiring and uplifting. So how, how did you come to have your hands on these stories? Or how did these stories come to you? Well, we, we, we look, I mean, there's a lot of stuff on social media. Um, there was, we look for interviews that people do. Often it's easier for the newspapers sometimes to do interviews because we work in television and obviously people don't have television cameras at home, even if they have iPhones. But so, I mean, there's plenty of good news being collected by all sorts of news organizations around the world. But we just wanted to make it into like a two times a week um, like TV program. And specifically, I want to be able to speak to people about um, their experience. So if someone films a funny video, we don't just want to put the video on. We want to speak to the people who made the funny video. So, um, yeah, it's just we have a team of producers in New York. I work from home in London and we, we do our best. Yes. So what are among the stories that touch you the most? I think there was a lovely story about um, a group of school children in uh, Texas who decided to write letters to uh, a hospital in New York and where obviously because New York is the epicenter and they wrote all these letters and what we decided to do was we we got on a FaceTime and we got the doctors and the students to speak to each other and to thank the students for writing the letters. And the letters now have been published and they're going to lots of different hospitals in New York. Um, so it just, it, it's nice because you can bring people together. Another amazing one for me was um, a couple in New York, 105 years old and 95 years old. And they spoke to me about, you know, um, how to survive through difficult moments. And her name is Naomi Raplensky. She's a famous poet. And then she read, she read me one of her poems. Um, and to speak to a 105-year-old on Skype is a little bit difficult, but it was OK in the end. Wow. It must be quite a challenge to interview someone who are 105 years old over Skype. Yeah, exactly. She, I mean, obviously, she has poor hearing now because she's, so, she's 105. But she was still full of spirit and energy, and um, it was a bit difficult. We had a lot of questions where I'd ask the question, and I said, how are you? And then she thought I said, how old are you? So we had a, a funny <laughs> moment like this. And so far, James, how do people, how do Americans react to your story? Because right now, the situation in, in New York, in America, is quite serious with COVID situation. Well, people have been, they like it because I think they need uplifting. You know, when it's difficult, when we're faced with these problems, um, it's nice to have moments of uh, release and reflection and positivity. Um, you know, because when we work in the news, often only the bad news is the headline. But there are good positive moments and I think Americans like to be reminded of it like anybody else. Even in New York, you know, there's so much creativity. This is one of the most creative multicultural cities on earth, and they have so many good stories. And um, yeah, they like hearing about it. So and James, what, what is the, the overall the policy of ABC in reporting on this deadly virus and the guidelines? that you need to be very mindful about? Well, obviously, we for anything that's medical, ABC has their, our chief medical correspondent, um, Dr. Jen, and she has been leading the, in, you know, the kind of medical information and medical news. And so any new, any story that anyone hears or any government publishes about the, the crisis, the medical unit that ABC looks at it first. Um, anything that we gather from the internet, just like when we were before this crisis, we have a, a user-generated content team, they verify videos. Like for example, there was videos of Venice. People said there were dolphins in the water. 
but we have a team in New York that checks videos and they found out that that was fake. So it's possible with this story that you can, if you want to find lots of stuff from the internet, that's great, but sometimes you have to be careful. So we have a team in New York that looks at everything and makes sure that if we say something, that it's true. And you must be working from home for quite a while. How do you manage? I like it. It's, um, <laughs> I spend a lot of my time flying around. I haven't spent this much time at home in like three years. Um, this is where actually I do um, the report. I sit in my chair at home in my living room. We have some lights, which um, they gave me at work. And we just set it up and actually my boyfriend has to become like a professional cameraman because he has to use, um, he gets to use his camera and then we film it and record it. So it's okay, it's quite fun. Yeah, it's quite yeah. adventure. James, yeah. yeah, James, I know you're in London right now, but President Trump has said he wants to reopen the country in May. So what do you think is the general mood of, of the American people on this? I think the United States is having that debate. I think Britain is also having this debate. Um, it's certainly true that there is concern about opening a country too early. A lot of people are worried about this because, you know, um, if you look at New Zealand, they decided to lock down for one month and they've had one death. If you look at Germany, they're locked down. They're not making plans to open up South Korea. They're not, they had a long lockdown. And so I think if you look at countries where there has been success in, in beating coronavirus, they're the countries that had long lockdowns and lots of testing. And I think, I think a lot of people are, would be concerned that the lockdown would end before all of the testing had taken place. Um, but at the same time, people also understand that our economies have to function. And I think particularly in Britain and America, there is real concern about the economy crashing and uh, a sustain a long period of no economic growth is very, very bad. So you have to balance these two things. Um, I think uh, in this country, that debate about when we open up is going to continue and the same in America. Um, but the leadership in both countries says that they're taking medical advice. So whatever the medical advice is, I suppose, has to be followed. And James, for good news about coronavirus, you can also look for good news from Thailand and from Asia as well. You can do so as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> we would love, I haven't, I'm trying to think of something that I've done. We did a little bit of good news from Wuhan when they reopened the town, so in China. Um, but we haven't, looked at we haven't seen many good news videos from thailand i know that there are some so we want some so anybody in thailand who has some good news please send it to me we put it on the news good. it'll be great yeah. i can yeah i can assure you that we don't have shortage of acts of kindness here in thailand under the presence of comes i'm sure <laughs> i'm sure i'm sure okay thank you very much james for joining us and sharing your thoughts about how you report, especially on looking for the bright side during this coronavirus outbreak. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Nice to see you again. Okay, see you. okay that's so, the Kunata, view. Yeah, Ka. very uplifting to talk to the journalists I mean, who are concerned about uh, giving people a chance to listen and see stories that are inspiring, uplifting in times like this. Yes, because during the difficult time, we all need something to lighten our mood up, especially to see positive story, uplifting stories. And according to the whole region, Kuntep Chai, the whole region, ASEAN, and especially plus three country, Japan, China and South Korea have to work on what's the measure that we can all fight the COVID-19 all together as the region. And we can see how journalists have to work hard during this difficult time as well. And we have to have different kinds of code of conduct in doing our job.
And right now we are waiting for Kunat Bunak to tell us about a recent seminar about how journalists should be handling the situation, especially in the report during this crisis. Kunat, so can you tell us about the story of journalists in this crisis? So in the seminar, which was organized by AIBD Malaysia, there were journalists from many countries in Asia, as well as representatives from organizations such as WHO Thailand, as well as UNESCO in Jakarta. So most of the journalists actually shared their experience during the pandemic. So one was the one was one of them was the WHO, they actually shared on how they they think they should fight with the coronavirus as well as other countries where like um, like Phoenix TV actually shared their experience in reporting from Wuhan as well as other places, other media outlets actually had a dedicated newsroom for reporting on COVID-19, informing the public of what is going on, as well as debunking all the fake news that are circulating on social media. And what the guideline that they provide for journalists who are work working on the situation? So there are a few guidelines for the media when they actually report on the situation. During this time is where so many fake news are circulating as well as misleading information. So what they actually advised the journalists are they're supposed to use the information that, that are from reliable sources such as the WHO. So using the information from WHO will help the individuals and communities to protect themselves and others, as well as reporting on the government's response and the community's reactions as well as raising concerns from the community. But at the same time, besides on reporting such issues, you should also take this opportunity to bring more positive stories to the public because despite all the negative stories we're hearing, there are still positive stories to it as well, such as like solidarity, compassion, generosity, as well as creativity during this times as well. Some organizations also share their concern that Journalists that have to report during this pandemic would experience mental health issues because if we're reporting on pandemics, it, it's possible that such stories can be distressing and can be draining at the same time. Yes, yeah, so journalists during this crisis has to be careful because our job is not easy, it's quite stressful enough, and then we need to find positive view or positive story to help audience to feel a bit more relaxed as well. Yeah, it's not easy when you have to report about deaths, about losses. You have to talk about figures, talk about grieving of people. Then, I mean, it's something that is of a big challenge for, for journalists uh, to frame the story to keep public informed and at the same time to make sure that you don't uh, frighten the people with, uh, with, with, with the way you report or how you report. So I think, I think there's something that, uh, that certainly weighs heavily on the mind of journalists every day and every night. So I would say that the journalists and the media have such a huge responsibility in terms of giving information to the public because I'm pretty sure that all the audience are looking for accurate information and reliable information in such a crisis like these. So many organizations also advise the journalists not to only just focus on the on the facts as well, but the their main focus is to report accurately and professionally, but at the same time, you should not use misleading headlines or anything that will distress the viewers. So avoid rumors and speculations. And if there is anything you could verify, just verify it as well. Avoid rumors and fake news. 
because during this time, everyone is looking for information that is relatable yeah. and to protect themselves, basically. Of course, and what's the, the most important, fundament, the fundamental I mean, principle for journalism? I think the most fundamental part of being a journalist here is not just to find the facts, but I think the biggest role here is for the public. I think as a journalist, you have to be reliable in terms of giving out the information. But if there are fake news circulating, you still have to find a way to inform the public that this is not true or find some scientific evidence to prove that yeah, hey, the, yeah, these right. news yeah, right. out there is, is mm -hmm. not true. So we have the reliable information. So th these are the things you have to you have to do. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The job is not to, uh, to report, but you also have the duty or obligation to make sure that fake news or disinformation uh, doesn't proliferate. And it's a job, your job too, I mean, to make sure that you you also find facts I mean, to dispute all the fake news or uh, information that uh, that is false and, and could uh, put the public uh, put the public in a very, very uh, frightening situation. Exactly. <laughs> and what's the recommendation, Kenneth, for reporters, especially because many of us are under stress during this kind of situation? What's the recommendation for media community? For the media community, I think there are many advice in terms of taking care of your physical health and your mental health. It is true that the reporting on pandemics can affect your health both mentally and physically. So there are other things. So for cases where you have to rep or you have to do field reporting, you have to determine the risk of where you're supposed to report. So what kind of protection do you need? And just do not hesitate to seek help and support if you do have to report in such a situation. Don't hesitate to share ideas with other journalists who share the same issue. And you can also take this time to develop your network and resources, if, especially if you cannot report at a certain location. So get in touch with your, your friends and your journalists to obtain more information as much as possible. So this way you can actually protect yourself from exposing with the virus. So you can still get the information even if you're working at home or even if you're not working at a location where the outbreak started. So, so I think like keeping, keeping a network of journalists, obtaining information would be another good way. Okay. So that's good advice for all of us during this time for what journalists should do in order to cope with pandemic COVID-19. Thank you very much, Kunat, for joining us. Thank you. Us. And during this weekend, is Easter holiday weekend in many countries, and we can see how people have to celebrate Easter holiday in their solitude, especially to stay at home, but still can connect with others. So let's take a look. As billions around the world marked the Easter holiday from lockdown and the coronavirus pandemic death toll steadily climbed worldwide, more than half of humanity is confined to their homes. As governments scramble to contain the disease's deadly march across the global, Let's see how different countries celebrate their Easter holiday. In Vatican, Italy, Pope Francis offered a prayer for coronavirus victims. In a live stream Easter Sunday message, delivered from Vatican to a world under lockdown, a coloro che sono morti e ai familiari che piangono per la scomparsa dei loro cari. In Spain, 
A Spanish prince Salvador celebrated Easter Mass behind closed door in Ronda. Holy Week processions were cancelled across Spain due to the national lockdown aimed at stopping the spread of COVID-19. Spain is one of the countries the world hit by the pandemic. One of the area in Paris celebrated Easter on their balconies, passing around bags of chocolate eggs using strings. In London, on St. Margaret's the Church in London live streamed their Easter service without a congregation present because of the distancing measure taken to slow the spread of the coronavirus pandemic. ...and prayers and blessings from All Saints Margaret Street in London to all who are worshipping with us virtually and also especially prayers for those suffering from the virus at this time. Billions around the world celebrated Easter Sunday from lockdown at home. As the Pope urged solidarity to fight the coronavirus pandemic. So that's how people can celebrate together Kuntepshai, even though they cannot stay close to one another during Easter holiday break, but they still can do so. Yeah, it was probably the, one of the most somber Easter's that we have ever seen. So, Kuntepshai, we were talking earlier about the virtual meeting of the ASEAN leaders tomorrow, the ASEAN summit. Uh, in which uh, Prime Minister Bajuta Nocha will be joining the other nine ASEAN leaders to talk about possible concerted and coordinated efforts to deal with the deadly virus. And of course, there has been question about the role of ASEAN in combating uh, this pandemic. And of course, we the other day, there was a, a, a small forum, an online forum, organized by ISIS Thailand to talk about uh, the role of ASEAN in, in, in the midst of, in the mid of this uh, crisis. And there were a lot of uh, interesting points made by the two experts, Kun Kavi Jongki Thawon and Dr. Titenan Pong Sutirak. And of course, there, there are always questions about whether ASEAN countries have done enough, or uh, have enough uh, sort of stamina I mean, to work together in deal with this very, very critical situation. Yes, that's right. It's a special agenda of 10 ASEAN countries with plus three countries, China, South Korea, and Japan, in order to try to seek way to work together to solve this crisis and to cope this coronavirus crisis all together. And right now we have Dr. Titinan Pong Sutirak, Director of ISIS Thailand, joining us. Good evening, Ajahn Titinan. Swadikab. Swadikab. Can you hear us well? Can, can, you, um, can you set your phone landscape horizontal, please? I'm sorry? Your phone, can you shape it, set it horizontal, landscape, yes, <laughs> okay, that's this works. Okay. Okay. okay, we are trying to have a camera set up ready for Dr. Titinan to be talking with us live. Okay, now he's back. That's great. Thank you for joining us. 
even though we have some technical Perfect issue, but here, we try to solve every connection to try to talk to you live. We have reported many times about ASEAN meeting tomorrow, Ajahn Titinan. What do you think we can expect from tomorrow's meeting? Well, I think, uh, you know, ASEAN uh, this year will have to recalibrate uh, all of its uh, agenda, its priorities. Already we're seeing some meetings being postponed. A lot of meetings have moved online. Uh, I understand that uh, Vietnam is trying to uh, uh, show some leadership and trying to adjust. I think the ASEAN plus three meeting is uh, particularly important because uh, if you look at the the handling of COVID crisis, COVID-19 around the world, in, in Asia, in the uh, Western Europe and uh, the EU, the US, uh, Northeast Asia has been seen as fairly effective and successful in um, minimizing and, and eventually containing and stabilizing the, the COVID crisis. Um, so for ASEAN plus three, ASEAN will need a lot of help. Uh, China is in a position to, to assist, I think, uh, based on its know-how, its experience, its medical supplies, its, uh, its resources. But South Korea has also has done well here. Um, and Japan, I think Japan recently uh, has imposed uh, measures of emergency rule, uh, flexible but still an emergency. So we don't know how much uh, preparations or how, uh, what kind of position Japan will be in to help. But certainly China, South Korea, um, this is something that I think ASEAN uh, countries will be looking, looking towards to, to assist them in their, in their handling of the crisis. You know, Dr. Tindian, in crisis like this, we of course expect uh, ASEAN countries to have coordinated and coordinated efforts in dealing with it in the coronavirus uh, in, in particular. But is it something that you have seen that uh, have taken place or something close to this kind of uh, coordinated uh, efforts among these ASEAN countries? Um, not really, because, you know, um, the, the COVID crisis, COVID-19, is, uh, is almost like every country for itself. Uh, all, all countries and all governments, all societies have been overwhelmed by the, the rapid uh, outbreak uh, and the uncertainty, the, the disruptions. So each country is having to grapple with it. I think that some countries, they had some lead time. They had some uh, advance uh, uh, notice, uh, you know, that they could have made better preparations uh, instead of waiting. I think a lot of people were just watching China in January and February. Uh, even the EU uh, countries were watching. And then once the virus made its way into Europe, into North America and uh, much of the rest of Asia, they were not as prepared. So for ASEAN, I think, uh, uh, this is something that they were not prepared, like most other countries. But ASEAN needs to see this uh, COVID crisis as a regional challenge, as a regional outbreak, because eventually, ultimately, uh, if you look at the, the map, for example, Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Vietnam, you know, they have uh, bor porous borders uh, in mainland Southeast Asia. So what, what happens uh, in these uh, countries can um, can cross borders, suppose that Thailand can stabilize the situation, uh, but uh, Cambodia and Myanmar cannot uh, put it under control, contain it. Eventually, Thailand can, can be reinfected from migrant workers in those countries. And ASEAN as a whole, I think that, you know, ASEAN has been so successful in um, uh, pitching itself as a uh, kind of a single production uh, base and uh, internal market, very large, almost uh, you know, 660 million people, $2 trillion GDP. So the ASEAN success story is very much premised on uh, economic success and development and economic growth. Uh, so ASEAN has to somehow see this as a regional problem, regional challenge, and to try to come up with a, a more regional solution um, and response. Otherwise, it could really undermine and undo a lot of the ASEAN successes that we've seen. I think all the ASEAN countries understand the severity of the situation. So why do you think none of the ASEAN leaders, I mean, came up and say, well, we have to sit down and work things together and make uh, make concerted effort I mean, to, to fight this uh, together? Vietnam, as a chair of ASEAN this year, should have taken that, that, that uh, role, right? Well, it's, um, it's the ASEAN, um strength and weakness at the same time. This is a very diverse region, uh, as you know, and the regional organizations uh, of ASEAN, they have uh, ways of working based on consensus, based on um, uh, 
uh, discussions, consultations. So it takes time for the 10 members to come to any kind of a, a consensus and agreement. It takes time. It takes time for the bureaucratic machinery to uh, to get into gear. Uh, and you know it, they have to sound out the different um, opinions from different countries, from senior officials all the way up to the cabinet um, and the, and the leaders. So you know I've I've said this and written about this that that somehow for this crisis, ASEAN has to be much more. Uh, responsive and um, it has to be some kind of accelerated shortcut, short track, uh, fast track response because they cannot go through the normal bureaucratic channels because the crisis is very much moving quickly and we can see it's, it's making waves all over the world and uh, Southeast Asia I think is just at the beginning. Ajanti Dinan, there's a report that Southeast Asian foreign ministers have endorsed the setting up of regional fund to fight COVID-19. Have you, have you heard anything about this? And what do you think the regional fund should be used? The regional fund, uh, basically, um, we will need uh, some kind of a uh, financial assistance package. They call it bailout package, you can call it rescue package, uh, or stimulus package. Uh, you know, eventually, these economies in, in, uh, in ASEAN will need a lot of financial assistance. Um, and this funding has to come from somewhere. So ASEAN itself, um, you know, the 10 member uh, states may not have enough of the funding of the resources to provide the, the necessary financial assistance uh, to, to rescue, to cushion the adverse impacts, which will be medium and longer term for the ASEAN countries, different ASEAN societies. Uh, this is, uh, I think this is very ominous, something that we, we must worry a lot about because a lot of people will be out of jobs. A lot of people won't have income. Uh, this is very, you know, very grassroots. Uh, Low-income people will be most affected. Um, and ASEAN, if they can come up with some kind of a regional uh, reservoir of, of funding, of assistance, uh, this is very much needed. But the question is, and we've had this experience before, back in 1997, 1998, the question is, you know, where is the money going to come from? Uh, last time, I think the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, was a lender of last resort uh, that came in, that stepped in, but with a lot of conditions that uh, this uh, region did not like. Uh, this time, uh, we could see maybe a helping hand from, from Japan traditionally, but I think China will try to step up now. Um, so we will have to see the size of the fund matters a lot. It's, uh, having a regional uh, fund is, is, uh, is necessary, is essential, but also the, the size of it, the scope of it, uh, has to be sufficient to address uh, what is needed, uh, especially for people who will be out of jobs and for the bankruptcies, for the people who won't have uh, food to eat and so on. After this whole thing is over, do you think ASEAN will look at China differently? It's especially in relation to its economic dependence on that uh, on the country. We were talking earlier about recalibration, the need for ASEAN to recalibrate its, its, uh, itself, right? It, its positions and everything. You mean that would also include China, ASEAN's relationship with China? I think that we will see most likely, most likely an intensification of uh, foregoing trends. So, you know, we, we can see already from Tepchai that uh, ASEAN uh, is heavily reliant on China. And China is not just ASEAN. China is a main market uh, for trade investment, exports, tourism, <clears throat> for all kinds of countries uh, in Asia and beyond. Uh, so, but for ASEAN, you know, because we're nearby, uh, China, I think the, the um, you call it dependence, I think the, the re reliance um, will deepen. We'll, we'll see a deeper uh, reliance on China, not just on trade, tourism, and, and so on, but um, you know, on in terms of uh, bailout funding, in terms of uh, economic recovery, partly because the EU and the United States will not be in a position to help out as much because they also will be suffering. But we we also have to bear in mind that you know, China also will suffer. Um, from some economic damages, uh, maybe even a, uh, certainly a slower growth this year, uh, maybe even a recession, certainly first half of the year. We will see if China can recover what, in what shape and what form uh, in the second half of the year. But China is also not in a great position, unlike the past, where it could lend a, a helping hand, uh, nor is Japan, uh, nor is South Korea. So this time, I think ASEAN will be very hard pressed, and, it, and ASEAN should try to help itself as much as possible. 
Okay. Thank you, Ajahn Titinan, for joining us in English version. But please hold on because we would like to talk to you in Thai as well. So that's the view from Dr. Titinan Pong Sutirak in English. He has joined us for Thai PBS World tonight, and we have listened to what's going to happen tomorrow, especially on the meeting, spatial agenda meeting among 10 ASEAN countries and plus three countries, China, South Korea, and Japan, in order to solve crisis of coronavirus altogether. And it's the test of solidarity of ASEAN countries as well. And right now, we like to join Dr. Titinan in Thai version. สวัสดีค่ะคุณผู้ชมกำลังอยู่กับไทย PBS World Tonight นะคะคุยกันต่อเป็นภาษาไทยค่ะเพื่อที่จะติดตามสถานการณ์โควิด -19 และการรับมือของทั้งภูมิภาคเลยนะคะคุณเทพชัยคะครับผมว่าเป็นประเด็นสําคัญมากเพราะว่าอาเซียนทุกประเทศนะครับต้องเผชิญกับปัญหาความท้าทายจากไอไอครั้งนี้เหมือนกันเลยนะครับตอนนี้ทุกประเทศก็คงจะว่าวุ่นกับการที่ต้องแก้ไขปัญหาของตัวเองจนกระทั่งมีภาพว่าอาเซียนซึ่งปกติแล้วจะมีภาพของการเป็นประชาคมที่ร่วมไม้ร่วมมือกันดีในการแก้ไขปัญหาต่างๆเนี่ยแต่มาเที่ยวนี้นักวิชาการที่ติดตามเรื่องอาเซียนมาตอนเรื่องหลายคนมีความเห็นค่อนข้างจะตรงกันนะครับว่าอาเซียนแทบไม่ได้พูดเป็นภาษาหรือเป็นเสียงเดียวกันเลยในเรื่องนี้ซึ่งก็เป็นเรื่องที่ก็คงจะเป็นเรื่องท้าทายมากในเมื่อวันพรุ่งนี้นะครับผู้นําอาเซียนจะมีการประชุมสุดยอดทางเทเลคอนเฟอเรนซ์นะครับจะเป็นครั้งแรกเลยที่จะประชุมสุดยอดแบบไม่เห็นหน้าเห็นตากันทางด้านกายภาพนะครับแต่ว่าจะคุยกันทางวิดีโอคอนเฟอเรนซ์ก็คงจะเป็นโอกาสดีครับที่ผู้นำอาเซียนจะได้จับข่าวคุยกันแล้วก็หารือกันแล้วก็ถึงแนวทางที่จะร่วมมือกันในการจัดการกับปัญหานี้แล้วก็พรุ่งนี้ก็เป็นเวทีที่จะมีอีกสามประเทศนะครับที่เป็นคู่เจรจาของอาเซียนคือญี่ปุ่นจีนและเกาหลีใต้ที่จะมาเริ่มร่วมแลกเปลี่ยนความเห็นแล้วก็คงจะกําหนดแนวทางทิศทางร่วมกันด้วยนะครับในการที่จะจัดการกับปัญหานี้ค่ะและช่วงนี้รองศาสตราจารย์ดรทิตินันพงศุธิรักผู้อำนวยการสถาบันศึกษาความมั่นคงและนานาชาติไอซิสจุฬาลงกรณ์มหาวิทยาลัยกลับมาคุยกับเราต่อเป็นภาษาไทยคะ่ะสวัสดีค่ะอาจารย์คะสวัสดีครับคุณนัทตาครับคุณเทพชัยครับค่ะพรุ่งนี้ค่ะการประชุมนัดพิเศษที่จะได้เห็นนะคะระหว่างอาเซียนและประเทศบวกสามคาดว่าจะได้เห็นอะไรจากการประชุมคะอาจารย์คือการประชุมของอาเซียนเนี่ยนะครับก็มีที่มีหลายหลายรูปแบบหลายหลายแวดวงด้วยกันนะครับวงพรุ่งนี้เนี่ยผมคิดว่ามันเป็นวงอาเซียนบวกสามที่มีความสําคัญเป็นพิเศษเป็นพิเศษต้องยกระดับความสําคัญขึ้นมาเพราะว่ามันมีวาระวาระเร่งด่วนเร่งด่วนก็คือเรื่องของโควิด -19 เนี่ยนะครับที่เป็นวิกฤตไปรอบทั่วโลกเลยโดยเฉพาะในฉากนี้นะครับประเทศอาเซียนเนี่ยเรียกว่าสะบักสะบอมเรียกว่าน่วมกันโดนกันทุกประเทศเลยนะครับโดยเฉพาะไทยเราเองก็เห็นชัดๆอยู่แล้วแต่ว่าอินโดนีเซียและฟิลิปปินส์เนี่ยผมก็คิดว่าน่าเป็นห่วงเพราะว่าประชากรเยอะแล้วก็อัตราของการติดเชื้ออัตราของคนที่ที่เสียชีวิตเพิ่มขึ้นค่อนข้างสูงนะครับของของไทยเนี่ยช่วงสัปดาห์ที่ผ่านมาค่อนค่อนข้างอาจจะนิ่งนิ่งขึ้นหน่อยอัตราลดลงนะครับก็แต่ก็ยังต้องน่าเป็นห่วงอยู่ดีครับเราไม่รู้ว่าเกิดอะไรขึ้นผมคิดว่าในขณะเดียวกันเนี่ยประเทศอย่างเมียนมาลาวกัมพูชาเวียดนามเนี่ยซึ่งมีพรมแดนที่ติดกับเราไปไปไปมาหาสู่กันมีคนมาทํางานแถวประเทศเราได้อย่างนี้เพราะฉะนั้นคนเหล่านี้นะครับต้องประเทศเหล่านี้ต้องต้องร่วมมือกันเป็นพิเศษเพราะว่าถ้าสมมุติว่าเราประเทศไทยเนี่ยเริ่มที่จะคุมได้เอาอยู่เนี่ยนะครับเริ่มที่จะนิ่งนิ่งนะอัตราคนที่หายเริ่มเริ่มจะใกล้ๆกับอัตราคนที่ติดเชื้อเพิ่มอัตราคนตายน้อยลงเริ่มจะเรียกว่าควบคุมได้เนี่ยถ้าถ้าเราไม่ระวังนะครับถ้าประเทศเพื่อนบ้านเขาเราไม่สามารถควบคุมได้คนติดเชื้อเพิ่มคนตายเพิ่มอย่างนี้ในสุดแล้วเวลาเขากลับมาทํางานบ้านเราซึ่งเราต้องการรายงานเพราะในสมัยก่อนนี่นะครับก็อาจจะนําเชื้อไวรัสอันนี้กลับมาติดประเทศเราได้อีกนะครับคนคนไทยได้อีกก็ก็เป็นเป็นภาพที่ทําให้เห็นว่าการการที่จะเผชิญรับมือแก้ปัญหา
ไอ้โควิดไวรัสเนี่ยนะครับที่เป็นวิกฤตเนี่ยมันจะต้องทําในในรูปแบบของภูมิภาคไปด้วยนะครับเพราะว่าในภูมิภาคนี้เนี่ยก็ครึ่งซึ่งกันและกันสูงอยู่แล้วนะครับในเรื่องเศรษฐกิจการร่วมมือต่างแล้วก็อาเซียนเป็นเป็นศูนย์กลางนะครับในการที่จะเสริมสร้างความร่วมมือระดับภูมิภาคกับประเทศต่างๆรวมถึงยุโรปด้วยอเมริกาด้วยเนี่ยนะครับแต่ว่าในในกลุ่มผมคิดว่ากลุ่มบวก3เนี่ยตอนนี้เป็นเป็นกลุ่มที่สําคัญมากเป็นพิเศษยกระดับเลยเพราะว่าจีนญี่ปุ่นและเกาหลีใต้เนี่ยเรียกว่าได้ได้ขึ้นชื่อเลยนะครับที่ผ่านมาโดยเฉพาะเกาหลีใต้กับจีนแล้วก็ไต้หวันด้วยไต้หวันไม่ได้อยู่ในในแวดวงนี้นะครับแต่ว่าได้รับการยอมรับว่ารับมือได้ได้ดีแล้วก็อย่างจีนเนี่ยซึ่งเป็นประเทศที่เรียกว่าให้กําเนิดหรือว่าไวรัสเริ่มจากที่นี่กันแล้วกันนะต้องพูดว่าเริ่มจากที่นี่นะครับที่ติดเชื้อที่เป็นวิกฤตเนี่ยแล้วก็ก็ลามไปทั่วโลกแต่ว่าจีนเนี่ยเขาคุมได้ก่อนคุมได้ก่อนแล้วก็มีทีท่าว่าจีนจะสามารถเริ่มเปิดทํากิจกรรมทางธุรกิจเศรษฐกิจเขาอาจจะเริ่มเปิดได้บ้างนะฮะก็เริ่มเริ่มเห็นมาบ้างแล้วเกาหลีใต้ก็เช่นกันจํานวนผู้ติดเชื้อนั้นไม่มากครับถ้าถ้าถ้าเปรียบเทียบกับประชากรแล้วก็ไม่กี่ร้อยในระดับร้อยเนี่ยนับว่านับว่าใช้ได้แล้วก็เขาก็มีความพร้อมในด้านของการการการตรวจสอบตรวจนะฮะคือว่าตรวจว่าติดโรคหรือเปล่าอย่างนี้แล้วก็ญี่ปุ่นก็ได้รับค่ะอาจารย์ทิตินันอยู่ไหมคะน่าจะมีปัญหาเรื่องการส่งสัญญาณนะคะคแต่ว่าก็กำลังฟังและอาจารย์ก็ระบุว่าจะเป็นการประชุมที่สำคัญมากนะคะคุณเทพชัยโดยเฉพาะวาระการยกระดับกับกลุ่มประเทศบวก3ก็คือจีนญี่ปุ่นเกาหลีใต้ซึ่งก็ได้เห็นการพยายามรับมือแล้วก็ถือได้ว่าประสบความสำเร็จในระลอกแรกนะคะก็น่าจะได้แลกเปลี่ยนองค์ความรู้กับทางอาเซียนด้วยนะคะอาจารย์กลับมาแล้วนะครับได้ยินไหมครับเสียงอาจารย์ยังมีปัญหาอยู่นะครับอาจารย์ทิตินันมีปัญหาเรื่องเสียงนะคะดูเหมือนไมโครโฟนอาจารย์จะหลุดนะคะลองขยับสักนิดหนึ่งนะคะเอาละค่ะเดี๋ยวสักครู่ถ้าแก้ปัญหาได้เราก็จะคุยกับอาจารย์ต่อนะคะอย่างที่อาจารย์ตรงนี้คงต้องจับตาดูตรงนี้ต้องจับตาดูแล้วครับคุณนัฐาว่าว่าว่าอาเซียนสิประเทศกับอีกสามประเทศยักษ์ใหญ่ทางด้านเศรษฐกิจในแถบนี้จะสุดท้ายแล้วจะมีบทสรุปยังไงที่จะทํางานด้วยกันหรือเปล่านะครับผมคิดว่ามันมีความสําคัญอย่างมากที่อาเซียนสิประเทศนั้นจะต้องจับมือกับจีนเกาหลีและญี่ปุ่นครับในการที่จะฝ่าฟันอุปสรรคตั้งใหญ่ครั้งนี้ไปด้วยกันคือตอนนี้ผมเชื่อว่าทุกคนคงมีความรู้สึกแบบเดียวกันละนะครับเพราะว่าผ่านประสบการณ์ผ่านความสบักสบอมมาที่คล้ายกันนะครับเพราะฉะนั้นไม่มีทางอื่นครับก็ตั้งสิบประเทศบวกกับอีกสาประเทศใหญ่นี้ก็คงจะต้องจับมือกันแล้วหาทางที่จะทํางานด้วยกันละในการที่จะไม่ใช่แก้ปัญหาเฉพาะหน้าอย่างเดียวนะครับแต่ว่าเป็นการที่จะวางแนวทางในการที่จะจัดการกับผลกระทบทางด้านเศรษฐกิจทางด้านสังคมที่ตามมาอย่างแน่นอนครับหลังจากที่เอาไอตัวไวรัสไอไวรัสตัวร้ายนี้อยู่มันใช่ค่ะถือว่าเป็นวาระร่วมกันสำหรับอาเซียนนะคะและช่วงนี้อาจารย์ทิตินันยังได้รับสัญญาณว่ายังต่อสายไม่ได้นะคะได้ไหมคะอาจารย์ได้ยินเสียงทางนี้ไหมคะอาจารย์ค่ะขออภัยด้วยดูเหมือนไม่จะมีปัญหาค่ะทางทีมงานเรายังไม่ลดแล้วความพยายามนะคะเดี๋ยวจะพยายามติดต่ออาจารย์ให้ได้นะคะเพื่อที่จะได้คุยกันต่ออย่างที่คุณเทพชัยเมื่อสักครู่ก็ได้ระบุไว้นะคะการเรียนรู้จากกลุ่มประเทศบวก3สําคัญมากในห่วงเวลานี้นะคะคุณเทพชัยจีนญี่ปุ่นและเกาหลีใต้เพราะว่าถือว่าเป็นระลอกแรกของประเทศที่ต้องรับมือกับโคโรนาไวรัสการระบาดแล้วก็คุมสถานการณ์ได้ในระดับหนึ่งนะคะเพราะฉะนั้นการเรียนรู้และการหาทางร่วมมือกันในช่วงเวลานี้น่าจะสำคัญอย่างมากค่ะเพราะว่าสิ่งที่จะเกิดขึ้นอย่างแน่นอนก็คือว่าประเทศต่างๆในยุโรปครับและแม้แต่สหรัฐอเมริกานะครับซึ่งตอนนี้ก็ค่อนข้างจะย่ำแย่จากไอ้ไวรัสตัวร้ายนี่นะครับโอกาสที่ประเทศในกลุ่มนี้จะยื่นมือมาช่วยประเทศในแถบอาเซียนหลังจากแก้ปัญหาเรื่องของการระบาดของโรคนี้แล้วเนี่ยก็เป็นเรื่องที่ค่อนข้างจะยากเหมือนกันนะครับเพราะทั้งอเม
เอาละค่ะคุณเทพชัยเราได้รับสัญญาณว่าอาจารย์ทิตินันกลับมาได้แล้วนะคะเดี๋ยวจะลองทดสอบนะคะอาจารย์ทิตินันได้ยินเสียงทางนี้ไหมคะผมได้ยินครับได้ยินได้ยินผมไหมครับได้ยินค่ะได้ยินค่ะอาจารย์แล้วกลับมาเรื่องเรื่องอาเซียนเหมือนที่อาจารย์พูดเมื่อสักครู่นะครับว่าทุกประเทศก็สะบักสะบอมแต่ว่ามันก็มีคนคาดหวังว่าตอนที่เกิดโรคระบาดนี้ใหม่ๆเนี่ยอาเซียนควรจะรู้ตัวเพราะก็มีกลไกในการประสานงานกันอยู่แล้วในการรับมือกับภัยพิบัติเรื่องของโรคระบาดทั้งหลายเนี่ยแต่ทําไมอาจารย์คิดว่าปีกระยาของอาเซียนในการทํางานร่วมกันด้วยกันในเรื่องนี้มันถึงช้ามากครับความพร้อมนะฮะเราถ้าเราดูได้หลายระดับครับคุณเทพชัยคือความพร้อมของการสาธารณสุขอาเซียนเราเนี่ยค่อนข้างอ่อนนะฮะคือถ้าเกิดนับไปแล้วเนี่ยอย่างสิงคโปร์ไทยมาเลเซียนับว่านับว่าใช้ได้นับว่าเป็นที่ยอมรับแล้วก็ถ้าไปเปรียบเทียบกับนานาชาติแล้วก็ก็ก็พอไหวนะครับโดยเฉพาะไทยเองแล้วก็สิงคโปร์แต่ว่าประเทศอื่นๆนั้นเนี่ยผมคิดว่าความพร้อมเนี่ยมันมันไม่มีที่เขาจะต้องการร่วมมือกันยังไงนะก็ตามเนี่ยเขามีข้อจํากัดอยู่แล้วนะครับและอย่างหนึ่งคืออาเซียนเนี่ยมักจะมักจะเหมือนกับว่าต้องต้องรอให้ปัญหามันเกิดก่อนก่อนนะครับคุณเทพชัยถึงจะถึงจะพยายามมาแก้กันคือว่าการเอาไว้ก่อนเนี่ยก่อนที่ต้องมาแก้เนี่ยเป็นอะไรที่อาเซียนไม่ค่อยถนัดนะฮะไม่ค่อยถนัดดังนั้นถ้ามันไม่เป็นวิกฤตที่มาถึงตัวแล้วเนี่ยก็จะจะร่วมร่วมมือกันป้องกันก่อนนี่จะยากหน่อยนะครับในขณะเดียวกันผมคิดว่ามีความชะล่าใจไปด้วยนะครับคือว่าที่ผ่านมาเนี่ยเราก็ได้เห็นว่าอย่างไทยเราเองหรือแม้ว่าประเทศเพื่อนบ้านก็ตามเช่นกันเนี่ยคือไม่คิดว่ามันจะแรงขนาดนี้ไม่คิดว่าเหตุการณ์สถานการณ์การแพร่เชื้อเนี่ยการระบาดมันจะมันจะเร็วและแรงขนาดนี้ก็ก็หลายๆอย่างบวกกันนะครับทําให้เราเห็นว่ากลุ่มประเทศอาเซียนนั้นสะบักสะบอมแล้วก็ไม่ไม่ไม,ไม่ไม่มีความพร้อมแล้วก็นะครับยังยังยังเอาไม่อยู่นะครับสถานการณ์นี้ยังคุมไม่ได้โดยเฉพาะในหลายประเทศที่ผมคิดว่าอย่างเช่นฟิลิปปินส์อินโดนีเซียและแม้ทั้งเมียนมาเนี่ยผมก็เป็นห่วงนะครับประเทศไหนที่ที่ตัวเลขต่ําๆเนี่ยเราเราก็จะสงสัยว่าเขามีความพร้อมในการในการต,ตรวจสอบหรือเปล่าหรือว่าในการที่ออกจะเทสไหมมีเทสคิดไหมมีอุปกรณ์พร้อมไหมอะไรเงี้ยนะครับก็ผมคิดว่ายังเพิ่งเพิ่งเริ่มครับคุณเทพชัยแต่อาเซียนครับที่มีวิกฤตต้มยำกุ้งเนี่ยวิกฤตต้มยำกุ้งนั้นเนี่ย IMF เขาเข้ามาช่วยแล้วก็พวกฝั่งประเทศตะวันตกนะฮะเศรษฐกิจทั้งยุโรปอเมริกาเขาก็ยังมีความพร้อมแต่ว่าตอนนี้เนี่ยถ้าจะเพิ่งใครก็ต่อแถวๆบวกสามเนี่ยนะครับประเทศไทยไม่ไม่ได้เป็นประธานอาเซียนในปีนี้นะคะอาจารย์บทบาทก็คือเวียดนามแต่ว่าไทยควรจะพยายามส่งเสียงสะท้อนในเวทีการประชุมในวันพรุ่งนี้อย่างไรไหมคะคือผมคิดว่ามีหลายๆอย่างเลยนะครับที่เรียกว่าอาเซียนเนี่ยเขาจะจะทํากันไปได้ก่อนเลยคือว่าที่มันไม่ยากมากคือไม่ต้องคงคงเห็นพ้องต้องกันง่ายๆหน่อยเช่นการการการแชร์การการแบ่งแบ่งปันความรู้ข้อมูลความรู้ต่างๆประสบการณ์ต่างๆในช่วงจากสิงคโปร์แม้กระทั่งการช่วยเหลือทางด้านอุปกรณ์การแพทย์นะครับเครื่องมือต่างๆเข้ามาเครื่องมือการตรวจสอบนี่เวียดนามเขาก็มีการเวียดนามนี่มีการตรวจสอบไปเยอะนะครับมาเลเซียเช่นกันนะฮะว่าใครติดไม่ติดติดขนาดไหนเนี่ยเพราะฉะนั้นก็มีการการแชร์กันเนี่ยเรื่องข้อมูลข่าวสารเรื่องเรื่องของใครติดมากน้อยเท่าไหร่เนี่ยผมคิดว่านี้เนี่ยทำทำได้เลยผมคิดว่าพวกลูกโซ่อุปทานเนี่ยนะครับพวกสป라이ดเชนที่โดนแรงกระเพื่อมอยู่ตอนนี้เนี่ยสั่นคลอนอยู่เนี่ยก็อาจจะสามารถที่จะนําบางส่วนเนี่ยนะครับมามามาผลิตมุ่งมุ่งไปทางผลิตเป็นมาทางผลิตพวกผู้อุปกรณ์การแพทย์เพื่อจะรับมือกับโควิด19นี้นี่ได้ก่อนนะครับในขณะเดียวกันเนี่ยเรื่องของการกักตัวหรือว่าการร่วมมือกันในการที่จะคุมสังคมของตัวเองเนี่ยนะครับไม่ให้ไปมาหาสู่อะไรเงี้ยในในเบื้องต้นเนี่ยผมคิดว่านี้ก็ก็ทำได้ไม่มีหลายๆมาตรการที่อาเซียนทำทำไปได้ก่อนนะเวลานี้เลยโดยเฉพาะเรื่องข้อมูลข่าวสารเรื่องเรื่องการรับมือความรู้ประสบการณ์ซึ่งผมคิดว่าอย่างสิงคโปร์เนี่ยเขาน่าจะมีอะไรที่ที่ช่วยได้เยอะในในขณะเดียวกันเนี่ยไทยเองก็เรื่องของการแพทย์ก็มีความแข็งมาเลเซ
แต่ถ้าเทียบกับทางกลุ่ม EU สถานการณ์อาจจะดูหนักกว่าเราไหมคะคือเขาเขาหนักกว่าเราครับคุณนัชชาเราเห็นได้ชัดแต่ว่าเราต้องอย่าไปคิดอย่างนั้นนะครับเพราะว่าในสุดแล้วเนี่ยมันเราก็อาจจะหนักขึ้นก็ได้ครับเรามันมันเป็นคล้ายๆแบบเป็นคลื่นนะครับมันไปมาจากจีนแล้วก็แล้วก็คลื่นนี้ก็พัดพาไปที่ต่างๆจีนก็เริ่มดีขึ้นคลื่นลูกนี้ก็ตอนนี้ก็ไปทางยุโรปตอนนี้ยุโรปก็เริ่มเริ่มที่จะดูเหมือนว่าจะเริ่มนิ่งหรือว่าอัตราการติดเชื้อก็ลดลงนะครับในช่วงไม่กี่วันที่ผ่านมาครับสัปดาห์ที่ผ่านมาเนี่ยจนกระทั่งบางประเทศอย่างสเปนเนี่ยเขาก็เริ่มที่จะเปิดบางบางส่วนของของเศรษฐกิจแล้วนะครับเพราะนั้นเราเราต้องอย่าผมคิดว่าเป็นไปได้ครับว่าเราจะเจอภาระที่ยังหนักขึ้นเรื่อยๆนะครับในแถวอาเซียนแต่ในตอนต้นเนี่ยถ้าดูคําถามของคุณนัทธาผมว่าตอนตอนต้นตอนที่เริ่มเริ่มเมื่อสักกุมภานะครับแม้ทั้งมีนาเนี่ยทางทางยุโรปเนี่ยเขาไม่ได้ไม่ได้เตรียมตัวเตรียมใจไว้เลยเขาคิดว่าเขาคิดว่าเรื่องนี้มันเป็นเรื่องของพวกเอเชียพวกจีนอะไรเงี้ยคงไม่มาถึงเขาขนาดนี้นะครับขนาดนี้เขาก็เลยเวลาเมื่อเมื่อชื่อความระบาดมันมาถึงเนี่ยเขาก็เลยรับมือกันไม่ทันแล้วเราก็เห็นนะตัวเลขของอิตาลีเนี่ยพุ่งแบบจนใจหายนะครับน่าใจหายแล้วก็น่าน่ากลัวมากเป็นก็เช่นกันตอนนี้ก็สหรัฐอเมริกาก็ก็ไปทางนั้นนะฮะแต่ว่าเราต้องอย่าไปคิดว่าเราก็อาจจะโดนได้เหมือนกันนะครับแม้กระทั่งแอฟริกาก็อาจจะโดนได้เหมือนกันเนี่ยผมก็ยังดูดูอยู่แล้วก็อินเดียเนี่ยเป็นประเทศที่ประชากรเป็นหนึ่งพันหนึ่งร้อยกว่าล้านคนเนี่ยก็น่าน่าเป็นห่วงเหมือนกันครับค่ะเอาละค่ะอาจารย์เสียดายว่าเวลาเราหมดแล้วนะคะมีปัญหาในช่วงกลางกลางก็เลยอาจจะทําให้เนื้อหาขาดหายไปบ้างแต่ว่าทั้งหมดก็คือการประเมินสถานการณ์การรับมือกับโควิด -19 และการประชุมนัดพิเศษที่จะเกิดขึ้นพรุ่งนี้ระหว่างกลุ่มประเทศอาเซียนและกลุ่มประเทศบวก3ค่ะวันนี้ขอบพระคุณอาจารย์ทิตินันมากค่ะอาจารย์สวัสดีค่ะคุณครับอาจารย์ครับและลาคุณผู้ชมไปเลยนะคะทั้งหมดก็คือไทย PBS World Tonight ค่ะคุณเทพชัยยองอาจารย์ทิตินันและดิฉันนัฐาโกโมลวาทินสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีครับ <coughs> เดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวโทรหาคุณเทพชัยก่อนเพราะว่า